This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We continue now to look at Afghanistan and conditions for women, reporters, those working for peace. On Wednesday, Afghan news presenter Shabnam Doran said in a video shared on Twitter she was prohibited by the Taliban from returning to work. My name is Shabnam Duran. I have been a journalist for six years, and I have been working with Mili Television when I heard that the new Taliban system's rules have changed. With the courage that I had in me, I went to the office to start my work. But the current system's soldiers didn't give me permission to start my work. They told me that the regime has changed. You are not allowed. Go home. I am asking the world to help me because my life is in danger. For more, we're joined by two more Afghan women who have left their country, both of them now in Toronto, Canada. Mariam Safi left Afghanistan just a few weeks ago, in July. She's the founding executive director of Organization for Policy Research and Development Studies, known as DROPS, and the co-director of the Afghanistan Mechanism for Inclusive Peace. And we're joined by Zahra Nader. She's a freelance Afghan journalist who is a reporter for The New York Times in Kabul. She's now based in Toronto, where she's a Ph.D. student in gender and women's studies at York University. She was born in Bamiyan, Afghanistan, and lived in Iran as a refugee for seven years returning to Afghanistan in 2003. She fled her native home in 2017 due to mounting danger she faced as a woman, a reporter, and a member of the Hazara ethnic minority, um, which for decades has been targeted by militants, including the Taliban, as well as the Islamic State. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Mariam, let's begin with you. You left, but we're planning to return uh, very soon to Afghanistan. Talk about what's happened and what you're hearing back in Afghanistan right now with your organization and the people who work for it. The, the situation in Afghanistan um, at the present moment, of course, is one that is that is um, endowed with, with, with frustration, um, uncertainty, um, fear. Uh, that is the, the that is the perception, um, and that is the sentiment we're hearing um, from those that we're in contact with on the ground, and um, and what had happened and transpired in the last few days are, are, is something that we really had not um, anticipated, and it was a complete uh, shock and disbelief uh, to to all of us. Um, we we had felt that there would be some space. Uh, for uh, a political settlement. And while things were getting very difficult in the last few months uh, between the negotiating parties, um, we felt that, that, that there was some degree of, of, of space there for, for negotiations to, to result uh, in, a, in, a, in a positive uh, solution. So what has happened has, has certainly caught everyone uh, by surprise. Mariam, could you clarify, what would you say would be a positive uh, resolution? What did you hope the negotiations would accomplish? Well, what all uh, uh, members of Afghan civil society and Afghans and Afghan society as whole had hoped for was a political settlement, um, a political settlement to, to bring an end to the violence that had plagued Afghanistan for so very long. And a political settlement would have looked uh, like a a, 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 a a situation where both parties uh, would come together. And of course, there would be certain compromises on the one hand, uh, but there would also be certain um, uh, promises and commitments, uh, particularly in protecting the gains of the last 20 years. Um, and it would have, and, and and so th that is what we were we were we were hoping to to achieve. Uh, it was never w one victory over another, and we all realized that military um, a military uh, uh, solution to this conflict did not exist. Um, so so a political settlement would have would have looked as one that would have protected the the gains of the last twenty years uh, for Afghans. Um, but as you see, that's that that certainly did not happen. Zahra Nader, uh, could you talk about your own experience having fled uh, Afghanistan not once but twice uh, as a refugee? And in particular, you worked as a journalist there. Can you uh, say what you've heard about uh, uh, how the Taliban has been responding to the attacks on journalists in Afghanistan uh, just in the last few days? Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um... 
I have been uh, a refugee twice, and I know it is it is very very hard uh, to live as a refugee. Um, the first time when the Taliban um, take over Afghanistan, my family fled to Iran, and as a refugee, I did not have any rights uh, to education to do what other children were doing, and that was very very heartbroken heartbroken for me. And seeing that happening again in Afghanistan is really, really painful for me. And uh, this, is, this is just awful that every day it is happening to Afghanistan. Uh, uh, about my work in Afghanistan, so I worked uh, at least around seven years as a journalist in Afghanistan. And my, in all my works, I was very focused on women's issue. I wanted uh, to cover the story of Afghan women, to do to see what they are doing in their lives and what what is their problem and uh, what's the the problem that they are dealing with, and uh, so I have in all those years I have never imagined that we would reach this day that we would again leave the Taliban uh, under the Taliban. I'm talking to my friends back home in Afghanistan, my journalist friend, my uh, the prosecutor friends, my. Uh, friends that work with the government, you know, at different level. And they're all saying, you know, it seems to us that we, our life was on pause for 20 years. And now we are just, again, going back, starting from 2001, where we left. Uh, so that is very heartbroken right now for me to, to listen to their stories and see how, what, what they are going through right now. Um, uh, this is uh, this is how I'm feeling right now. You know, my family and everybody is at home, and um, the fear of that, that f fear that I have when I was a refugee, a six years old girl flying Afghanistan, um, in a in a, in the back of a car, and I'm now seeing that happening in front of the airport. A lots of children like dragging, being you know, uh, in this stressful. What would happen? This even the seeing, the experiencing of. This uh, situation that this pupil, woman, everybody is facing in Afghanistan, that is a trauma that will never left them. As a, it did not left the, the fear, the experience that I had as a, as a uh, refugee, um, they still exist in me. They, they, are, they have like I have their their scars in my heart that as I go, as I go in my ways, it come back to me and make life harder for me. And I can't imagine that that's going to happen for a new generation in Afghanistan. I wanted to ask you about being part of the Hazara minority um, and talk about Bamiyan, where you were born. Uh, Bamiyan may be known by the world because the Taliban blew up the Bamiyan statues, the Buddhas, that were carved uh, back in 2001. Um, they were uh, blown up by the Taliban on orders from the leader at the time, Mullah Mohammed Omar, after the Taliban government declared they were idols. Um, <clears throat> they they uh, also um, uh, destroyed the uh, part of the statue of the Hazara leader, Abdul Ali Mazari, in Bamiyan, who they had killed back in 1995. Um, can you talk about the Taliban 2.0 that people are talking about today, back to then, and you as a Hazara, um, how you feel about what's happening to your people in Afghanistan? I feel that they would be definitely marginalized, um, at least for past 20 years, they, they received some rights, you know, they, they, can, they get education, they worked. Even do it was there always the, the systematic discrimination always existed against them in Afghanistan, but it was uh, much better. But now I feel with the coming of the Taliban, so we can see they are just you know um, uh, mullahs and uh, from one particular ethnicity, and uh, they would not tolerate you know other groups being part of part of the regime. Although they are saying it, but um, I'm fearful of like how how. People, not only Hazara people, but all all people of Afghanistan would live under the Taliban, you know, because they basically they are the people who are coming uh, from behind the uh, like behind the mountains. They, they spend all their life fighting, and now they are here to to rule our society. And I'm very very fearful of that. How that would unfold for our future, for future of our country. Um, specifically talking about the the Hazara problem and. They're, they have tried a lot to to tell the international community that we are there is um, a lots of discrimination 
systematic discrimination against Hazara people in Afghanistan, but it seems uh, it wasn't getting very much response. Uh, but now it's it's even get gonna get even worse um, because this group that are now in in power in Afghanistan they do not care about human rights they do not care about women's rights and they do not care about Hazara or any minority people's right um, and they would do anything that um, that they can they would do definitely what they did you know in uh, in ninety. Um, in 1990s, we know that they massacred Hazara in, in Mazar, they, they did um, in Bamiyan. So all of those are just the pictures that, that are coming up to us and a very, very traumatizing uh, moment for, for all of us. Mariam, uh, you know, we hear a lot uh, in the press here and, and elsewhere, of course, about what's happening in Kabul. Uh, could you talk about what you know of uh, the changes that have occurred in rural areas, uh, as well as in urban areas, and the distinction between the two? Because, of course, the reports are that the Taliban has been advancing across rural areas for much of the last year, and the government has really only, Ashraf Ghani's administration has only been fully in control of urban areas. Could you talk Talk about that. Well, I think that um, th to say that rural areas were under the control of the of the Taliban, while urban was under the control of of the government, um, that that's not entirely true. Um, uh, yes, uh, the Taliban um, did um, control uh, certain parts of the country. There are studies that show that about 11 percent in May, um, um, there, was a, there was a study that had come upon that showed 11 percent of the population lived under Taliban-controlled uh, uh, territory. Um, so that's 11 percent, and this was in May. Um, there were districts that were contested. Uh, and then there was districts, and that was the uh, um, a good majority uh, um, that was under the control of the the Afghan government. Um, so, so that was a scenario in May, and that has rapidly changed now, obviously. But uh, but in Afghanistan in the last 20 years, um, a lot of the development efforts um, have been focused and centered on 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 cities and in urban areas. And so urban areas have seen, have benefited a lot from the, uh, from the, from the international intervention, intervention, whereas rural areas, particularly villages and districts, uh, provincial city centers have still been better, uh, but rural areas um, and villages and districts um, have, have, have not have barely seen uh, that amount of, of, of development. And that's particularly be been because of either uh, violence, um, corruption, um, uh, uh, and other factors uh, that have prevented that from from taking place. Um, so, so it's 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 quite it's it's a mixed bag, um, and um, and uh, and so I would uh, I, I would say that we have to be careful when we're looking at the rural and urban divide in Afghanistan. There are there's many many drivers of conflict in Afghanistan, and there are many many factors um, that that have played a role in the last 20 years, and and how and how and this uh, divide has sort of um, um, increased and why? I mean, the the uh, president leaving was a shock to so many, right, uh, Ashraf Ghani. Um, it wasn't so much that the Taliban seized power in Kabul as they entered this vacuum. Uh, it wasn't that the um, Afghan government, that the military was fighting them. They just left, despite the billions that the U.S. military had put into them. Talk about that shock and why you think um, the that the Afghan government under Ashraf Ghani was so unpopular. Can you talk about it being, for example, what our next guest will talk about, a kleptocracy? Well, I would say that um, that a, a lot of what has transpired in the last five days, particularly on Sunday when the president, we all heard that 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 President Ghani had left. Um, uh, I think it's too too early at this present moment to say exactly what took place, and, and I do not want to to, to speculate. 
But I, w but I will say that the Afghan National Security Forces, and I've been seeing reports that have suggested that the Afghan National Security Forces basically just surrender the country. I, I would say it, it wasn't the forces. It, it was certainly the, uh, the leadership. There was a problem. There was a grave, grave problem in leadership. Poor leadership, political disunity um, have been um, a factor of where we are today. And there's no doubt in that. Um, and, and, and the Afghan National Security Forces themselves fought against all odds um, um, in these last, uh, in these last uh, few years, in these recent years, in particular in these last few months, when there's no reinforcement, uh, when, 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 there's, when, when they're not getting enough resources um, and they're left to, to both fight and defend for themselves, and it becomes very difficult. Um, and so the, the Afghan National Security Forces, I would say, even the development of the Afghan National Security Forces in the last uh, in the last uh, 10 to 12 years, I would say, is when this, this, this force was actually built, when it was in fact supposed to have been built in 2001. And it was the United States that took the responsibility of building the Afghan National Security Forces under the LEAD program. And, and, and while they built an Afghan National Security Forces in large numbers. This was a force that, that they were both building capacity while they're also teaching them literacy at the same time. Um, and, um, and in this process, um, there were a lot of areas where dependency upon the, Afghan, upon the U.S. forces and NATO forces uh, was something that, that, uh, that was established. Um, so there was a dependency on 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 certain uh, resources needed from from the United Nation from the United States and other forces. Um, so so the dependency was there. It, it was still a young army at the end of the day, um, and uh, and building this army itself uh, faced a lot of difficulties um, in the last uh, few years. I think they fought. They, they, they did what they could, but unfortunately, um, um, I would say the leadership uh, failed them. And, 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 that is, uh, and, and that's what studies will show you, and that's what uh, reports and media would, would, would show you, that it certainly was a failure of leadership. Mariam Safi, I want to thank you for being with us, Executive Director of the Organization for Policy, Research and Development Studies, co-director of the Afghanistan Mechanism for Inclusive Peace, and Zara Nader, uh, Afghan journalist, Ph.D. student at York University, both speaking to us from Canada. Next up, Washington Post reporter Craig Whitlock on the longest war in U.S. history, his new book, The Afghanistan Papers, A Secret History of the War, what the U.S. generals, what the U.S. government over the past past 20 years did not tell us about what they were doing in Afghanistan. Stay with us.